This is Kenneth R. Hunter, who served in the U.S. Navy, May 15, 1947, through October 29, 1961. He also served in the Army National Guard, December 2, 1975, and retired November 11, 1990. This interview is in Voorheesville, New York, March 17, 2003, at 11 a.m. June Hunter is the interviewer. What is your full name? My name is Kenneth Hunter, Kenneth Raymond Hunter, and I reside in Voorheesville, New York. And when and where were you born? I was born in New York City in 1930, the month of November. And when and where did you enlist in the Navy, and why did you enter the Navy? Well, we originally lived in New York City for most of my youth. Then, when my father retired from the Navy, we moved up to Steventown, New York, and it was like moving from the Great White Way to Siberia. And I think it had a traumatic effect on me then, and when I got close to my 17th birthday, it was time for me to make a decision. And with a little help uh, from my parents and from some advice from my father, I went into the Navy. I enlisted in Albany, New York in the month of May, 1947. And since you were rather young, do you remember what it was like in basic training and where did you go for this training? Well, after being processed at the Navy Recruiting Center in Albany, New York, which was the old post office, at that time they had the New York Central Railroad station right near that area, and it was quite the hub for Albany. And coming up from Steventown to enlist at the Navy facility there, uh, it was like uh, being dazzled. Uh, so many people, so many things to see and do. Well, when we went there, we went through uh, physical exams, we had uh, some uh, educational testing, and uh, uh, then we had to sign documents. Uh, our parents uh, also signed the documents. They furnished birth certificates, uh, things of that nature, uh, school records, and from there, we had to wait uh, for a little while because they booked us on a train, the New York Central Railroad, a short distance away from the old post office facility in Albany. And I believe we must have left in uh, the late afternoon. I recall that we were, several of us were going out to Great Lakes, Illinois, above Chicago, and that uh, we all had uh, sleeper cars. Well, it took quite a while to get out there. It was sometime the next day we got out there and uh, we were met uh, at uh, the station there by people from the Naval Training Center. It was quite a change. Uh, they weren't as polite and nice uh, as they were at the recruiting station because life was now settling into their way of doing things. They hustled us there. Uh, they took us uh, into a bus, uh, and from there we went to the processing center at the Great Lakes Naval Station in Illinois. While we were there, uh, we had to display what we brought with us uh, in our suitcases, and we're told what we could keep and what we couldn't uh, take with us. And surprisingly for all of us that were there, just about everything that we carried out with us was being shipped back home. We put the stuff in boxes, then we had to go through, uh, stripped down, naked, and we went through another processing there, physical examination, and uh, they started issuing us clothing. And uh, I remember that uh, they gave us shots, they checked teeth, everything. Then after that, uh, it was quite the awakening to uh, have our beautiful hair, all of us, go into the barber shop where they looked at us with smiles on their face as they took uh, the, the razors 
uh, the electric races there and cut us down. We all had uh, looked almost like we had baldy beans. In other words, our heads were almost shaved. Uh, uh, we all looked like uh, uh, creatures from another world. That way we were all on the same footing and so forth. Then we were in, uh, introduced to the chief petty officer who was the leader of our company. All of us that went out on that day in May of 1947 were assigned to Company 37 and we would be together for about three months. In that three month period uh, we went through quite a bit of regimentation in which uh, we were issued all the clothing. We had to learn how to do inspections their way. We learned how to march, how to uh, make sure that everybody was in step. Uh, we did all kinds of things. We even lined up uh, for more shots uh, and then for mess duty. Uh, everybody got a turn in, the, in being in the mess. The mess uh, for the uneducated is the place where they fed us. We'd get uh, three square meals a day there and the cardinal rule was, and they had it posted all over, take what you want, but eat what you take. And if you didn't finish the food you, and you started to go towards the place where you put your tray and all in, they had uh, other recruiters uh, or training personnel who would uh, look at us with the eye and in the stern orders, order us back to the table and we had to sit down and finish everything that was on our trays. When that was accomplished, then we could take them over and put them in to be cleaned, and we had to scrape everything off, uh, anything that was left out of the last piece of rice uh, that was, there was rice on your tray. Uh, they had lots of coffee, and everybody seemed to like coffee, and that's a Navy thing, because wherever you went uh, in the Navy, whatever station you were at, what office you worked in, there was always coffee brewing, and the guys took advantage of the coffee, especially when they're on watch duty. Now watches, uh, we were introduced to being on watches where it was like a form of guard duty. In the Navy they called it watches. So I guess in the other services they call it guard duty. It was our job to make sure when we're on watch duty that you never fell asleep and believe you me, they even came around to check on you to make sure that everything was going right, that you weren't uh, in some corner sitting down sleeping uh, because there were really harsh penalties then if they caught you at it because then you were at the mercy of your shipmates the whole company that you were in so that meant if I did something to bring dishonor on them by just even sleeping or not making up my bed everybody had to suffer so they had their way of getting even in the evenings when lights out came on uh, Maybe about an hour or two later, there was a surprise crew that would visit the person who created the situation. They would cart him off into the shower room. They would bring all his clothing, his sea bag, his mattress, everything. They would wet it down and they would then proceed to scrub the individual with what they called kaye brushes. They were a stiff brush like you would scrub the floor with and believe you me they were those bristles were as stiff as couldn't be because you had to use them also to clean your sea bag and your sea bag had to be spotless well the poor fellow who this happened to learned his lesson very fast because uh, the next day he was the model for everyone because he knew that if it happened again the treatment would be just as bad. And to make everybody aware of this, the chief who was uh, the leader of our company, Company 37, whenever something happened out of the ordinary, if we got a poor mark on an inspection when they came through the barracks or they inspected us in the ranks, well, at night time it wasn't unusual at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody was awakened. They had to be come out into the yard it didn't, they didn't give you time to dress and you had to march for an hour, maybe two hours. Lots of guys marching in bare feet. So you did your best to make sure that nothing dishonorable was done, 
that you didn't bring anything down on you, and everybody learned to operate as a team. Other training we had was in learning how to use the uh, rifle. Back then, they don't have, they didn't have the M1, which is standard today, and uh, the, the rifle that we had, um, I think it was the M1 back then. It had a terrible kick. I think the rifle that they use today is the M16. And the rifle that they used back then, it had such a kick in there that if you didn't position it right, it could come off the shoulder and hit you in the jaw, and uh, it would be very bruising, and uh, some guys were known to have lost a tooth or two. After we mastered uh, the use of the firearms, uh, we went through training in uh, learning how to operate the lifeboats, and it was everybody's uh, responsibility to man the oars properly, to learn where all the rations were on, the, on this thing, how to handle them so that they could last uh, for the length of time that they told you you were going to be adrift on the Great Lake. So uh, after that period was done, we also then learned how to fight fires on a ship. That is the worst kind of a fear that you can undergo is being on a ship that's on fire. Well, we dressed uh, in our uh, uniforms and our dungarees and all. Uh, we had to put spats on our feet to, to keep uh, the trou your trousers on your sheet on your uh, against your legs and boots as tight as can be, so that you could move through and not snag. Uh, anything. They'd always have to have two men on the hose because the force of pressure coming out of that hose was tremendous. Another fellow pro stood along the side of you holding a, an odd device that looked like a sprayer that was about six feet long. They were coating the area in front of you trying to knock down flames and smoke and so forth and you had to go in with that hose and you had a team of men behind you and you had a set amount of time that you had to get that fire out. The longer it took you to do it, the hotter it got in there and the smokier it got. And believe you me, fellows did everything that they could to master this training so that they could get away from the smoke that was in there and the intense heat. And you got it down to uh, the bare minimum and Finally, we qualified from and that and moved on to other things like learning how to fire 20 millimeters, uh, which, are, which were standard on ships uh, back then. They were the guns, the kind of guns that they used to uh, uh, fire at aircraft and other enemy small ships. And so when uh, the ships were in use, uh, the, gun, the noise from the gunfire was so horrendous there. In those days, they didn't have plugs like they have today, and uh, I can imagine that a great many people uh, suffered from uh, have ear hearing problems because of the noise from that. Well, after all the various air avenues of training were done, uh, and we reached a certain proficiency in there, uh, we would be moving on to the next step, which was a lot of uh, classroom schooling. We were also fortunate to have a weekend pass and uh, before we went on that weekend pass they made a dual thing out of it. They took us into Chicago, I believe it was for the 4th of July and we went to Soldiers Field where they were having a big uh, 4th of July celebration on in there. They had all, uh, they had the Navy Band and they had all the various recruiting companies there uh, doing their thing, marching around and uh, good order. They had some rifle teams that were doing precision rifle maneuvers. And uh, then when the break came and when they had uh, some celebrities doing entertainment there, they fed us a meal. And we thought that was the greatest. And uh, we were, the next day when we were to go, to go out, uh, uh, we would enjoy Chicago. Well, unfortunately, that meal, everybody in our company developed food poisoning. The entire company was sick for almost a week. So that added a week's training to our schedule. And after that week they felt sorry, they must have felt sorry for us because they gave us a two-day pass 
to go into Chicago. And almost everybody came back because uh, when you were a recruit, you didn't have much money and what could you do? Everything was so costly. I forget if it was uh, 15 or $20 a month pay you got. Uh, it was such a piddly sum compared to what is available today. But after that, uh, we did other training and pretty soon, a little more than three months uh, of training, uh, finally it came upon us and then we were granted uh, 10 days leave where we could go back home and at uh, that point, uh, based on the kind of training uh, and scores that we made on our test, they would determine when we came back what our duty assignments would be, what further schooling we would go to, and the reporting time was to, they were precise on that, but if you weren't there, you were going to be classified as AWOL, absent without leave. And nobody wanted to go and get additional punishment for this and forfeiture of pay uh, because you needed everything you had uh, to be able to get things going because from that point on, uniform replacements and all was your responsibility. And when the leave was, that leave was the fastest that ever happened, and the 10 days passed so fastly, and when we got back to Great Lakes, uh, a different life was going to begin. Okay, now can you tell us where you were assigned after that and what the various duties were that you had in the Navy? Well, I had a whole series of assignments in the U.S. Navy. Uh, after coming out of basic training, I was assigned uh, to the uh, Na Navy uh, barracks in Washington, D.C., right near uh, the Pentagon, uh, Arlington National Cemetery. My first training was in the IBM section, which was at that time uh, the beginning of today's computer. And at that time, uh, the they used a lot of punch cards. Everything was typed up on punch cards. And they printed uh, all the information off on big sheets of paper. And I don't know who it went to or what they did with it, but uh, it got to be very monotonous doing the same thing day in and day out. There were lots of things to see in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, often we were called on to do funeral details, and I remember uh, the first funeral detail where our entire uh, contingent at the Navy barracks was called on was for the burial of General Pershing, the Black Jack Pershing, who was a great uh, leader from World War I. In, I. I guess it was 1947, he died and uh, they had quite a ceremony for him uh, at Arlington National Cemetery and uh, didn't realize how hilly Arlington was until you participate in one of the, those events and all this marching you have to do uh, and the slowness of it uh, and all the military finery that went into it. I remember uh, his horse, uh, his caisson being uh, pulled by horses into the place there and right behind it I wondered why they had the riderless horse. Well, I found out uh, that's a tradition from the army. When someone of great stature passes and is buried, they always have um, a horse following without uh, its rider. Well, the ceremonies uh, were very impressive. The firing squads, uh, uh, lots of talk from the politicians, uh, uh, from military leaders and so forth. Uh, after that, uh, we participated in several other things and then I had the opportunity uh, to go into the Naval Aviation section and from there they transferred me down to Jacksonville, Florida. And I tra did some training there, uh, but they didn't give me the uh, aviation rankings yet because I was then transferred back up to Norfolk, Virginia and I remember serving on a troop transport cargo type ship there for a period of time, and after that uh, I did get the ranking and was transferred, uh, was able to, I went to some schooling in aviation supply. And uh, that led to other assignments uh, in the Navy, some of them uh, quite glamorous, others uh, routine. Uh, also, uh, while I had uh, 
the training in there down at Norfolk before I did get my ranking. They sent me to the Naval Amphibious Base and I worked on the Admiral's Command there. Uh, we did a lot of preparation and uh, all the paperwork for the uh, Flag Command that was there. At, uh, at uh, Little Creek, Virginia, they trained uh, the people underwater demolition teams. Uh, these people were highly skilled uh, people. They went through vigorous uh, testing to uh, make sure that they were up to this because they would have to work as a team and often alone. Teams of maybe three to four, and maybe as much as eight. And that was the beginning of what uh, eventually became what we know today as the SEALs. And they have quite a reputation on the kinds of things that they do. Well, after that uh, period of training was done, then uh, I was transferred into Fleet Aircraft Service 9 down in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's where I uh, got into training that was to prepare me for another transfer of our whole unit uh, to overseas and to Morocco. But before we went there, it had additional training in, uh, I believe it was Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas. I also learned uh, that uh, because we would be dealing with troop transports and because my specialty would be aviation supply, I was sent to a special uh, school in Patuxent River, Maryland, where I had to learn how to properly load aircraft uh, how much weight could be put into certain sections of the aircraft to make sure that it was balanced properly and also that it was tied down properly so that there would be no shifting of this when the aircraft took off or landed or during flight. Uh, that was quite interesting. It was long hours. Uh, you had to learn how to do things uh, in the daytime hours as well as nighttime hours and uh, it was uh, quite satisfactory, to, uh, got a quite, great deal of satisfaction of, on the day of graduation. Uh, the team that uh, I was trained with, we excelled uh, and we beat the other teams that were in training there. So uh, they transferred me back uh, to my home base there and eventually the whole unit was transported overseas to Rabat in Morocco. We were called FASRON 104. Now I'm not sure on which of the FASRONs I was in first. I was in, uh, I served in FASRON 9 and FASRON 104. Well, FASRON, F-A-S-R-O-N, stands for Fleet Aircraft Service Squadron. Our job would be to maintain aircraft from the fleet that was operating in the Mediterranean. And whenever there were modifications to those aircraft, they would bring squadrons in uh, one at a time. We would have all the supply equipment that they needed, radar, ammunition, uh, the weapons, uh, electronic systems, everything that they would modify. They kept them up to date because at that time our country was still faced with what came to be known as the Cold War. The, even though the real war was over, there was still a lot of tension, particularly with what was to be once our ally, or close, supposedly close ally, Russia, uh, there was a lot of tension still going on uh, between the United States, Britain, France, and the Russians. And it was very tough on those times because anything could start an incident. They always kept our aircraft up to date out of the fleet and when we finished with one squadron uh, and the tests and all were completed, they flew them back to the carriers, the Roosevelt, the Midway, the Coral Sea, which I was later to become stationed on. And then we did the whole routine started all over again when we brought in another squadron. They would usually have about uh, five, maybe six squadrons at the most on the carriers. And the crews uh, on there at times could total 2,500 to 3,000 men total force on the aircraft carriers. But on our base there in Morocco, we lived in Quonset huts. Uh, we had uh, work performed for us by uh, Moroccans in there. Uh, 
They dressed uh, in black clothing. We didn't know how they could stand it in it because the heat at times was so oppressive. And especially in the Quonset huts there, you could open the windows and doors uh, and they were screened and uh, hardly any breeze would come through at times. But needless to say, it was uh, an enjoyable experience. Uh, had some good friends, uh, but they have a saying, when you leave the place, all debts and friendships are cancelled and you start all over again, making new friends wherever you're assigned to. I had been in, uh, on the aircraft carrier Coral Sea. Uh, we participated in quite a few joint NATO exercises. And uh, I remember the first uh, day or two that I was on there, it was assigned to the electronic supply room. And I also had the paint storage locker, which was on the bottom deck of the ship. My two assignments, the uh, electronic storage room was right under the flight deck. And then the other room was way down in, I guess, almost the lowest level of the aircraft carrier that you could go. The thing I dreaded was when they sounded general quarters. And it always seemed to be that when I was down in the paint storage area, where we had other flammable type of articles, uh, liquids, that's when it seemed the general quarters would sound. And I would have to batten down the hatches in there, make it up four decks to be able to get to the, the passageway where I would go all the way forward on the ship to my battle station, the uh, 50 millimeter and 20 millimeter section. And uh, there are many times I didn't make it. The doors were shut, sealed tight, and I would stand there uh, and just have to wait until the drill was over. Well, you can say that uh, I came in for my share of uh, uh, corrective action because I couldn't make it there, but I don't know how anybody physically could have done it from five stores down. But uh, then uh, the rude awakening came was um, about my first or second, it may have been within my first week on the ship, uh, I found, uh, I enjoyed uh, the fact that the electronic storage room being under the flight deck uh, was air conditioned. And it was the nicest part of the ship and I imagine the officer's quarters were air conditioned. But uh, the crew's place uh, quarters down on the ship uh, often were very, it was very hot. At times it seemed like the air was pretty stale and so I would go up there. And I remember the first night that I went up there, I took a mattress up there uh, make myself comfortable to get a good night's sleep. Uh, all of a sudden, I hear this loud boom, and it kept happening, and I was wondering, Jesus, the ship uh, being hit by bombs. Well, that was my introduction to aircraft landing on uh, the Coral Sea. Uh, they make such a tremendous uh, impact when they hit the ship and are arrested by the, t the wires that go across the flight deck, grasp, uh, the tail hook and bring the aircraft to such a jarring uh, stop uh, that when they hit that thing it echoes through there and uh, after a while that got to be routine it didn't bother me. Uh, an, an enjoyable experience we had when they didn't have flight operations was to go out at night time uh, when we're cruising the Mediterranean and go up uh, to the area where the landing signal officer would be and uh, they had a net under there so that he could jump into that in case an aircraft missed uh, his approach to the landing on the aircraft carrier and he wouldn't be hit by propellers or uh, by the jet aircraft. He could jump down into this net and be safe and make his way back up for the next aircraft that was coming in. Well, we would guys sit in that thing at night time and use it as a hammock and uh, uh, it would be nice and breezy, the air would be cool as we're cruising along, and look up at the skies and see, it was so beautiful when you're out at sea to see all the stars in the heavens, and to pass uh, land masses there off on the horizon. Uh, it was quite an enjoyable experience. Uh, I re-enlisted, uh, was given other assignments, I was stationed at the Naval Air Station in uh, Beeville, Texas. Uh, uh, 
some shenanigans uh, was my tour was coming to a close uh, got me to a choice assignment um, I sent one of my uh, workers uh, uh, I told him that uh, the captain's wife needed uh, some toilet paper so uh, I told him to give her a call and see what uh, color paper she wanted well, uh, it landed up that when he went up there, he took two cases of toilet paper because she wasn't available. So he took one of each of one white and one color uh, of color. So when it got up there, uh, somehow she that she then called her husband, the base commander, uh, to find out uh, if he ordered it because she certainly didn't. And uh, when uh, they got down to the nitty-gritty, they found out who was responsible, who the ringleader was behind that. So they gave me a choice assignment. I was assigned to the Military Assistance Advisory Group in Indochina, what is called Vietnam. Well, when we traveled over there, our orders were, we would go for processing up into the Pentagon, where we uh, underwent uh, top security clearances, uh, and instructions on the kinds of things that were required of us that we would be dealing with both the uh, French government who had been defeated at Dien Bien Phu and our major assignment was to bring all the equipment that we could recover back to Saigon and the Cholon area to be loaded on US Navy transport and shipped elsewhere some items would be turned over to the uh, South Vietnamese forces and we would uh, train them and supply them. Well the French uh, were very reluctant to try to give anything back. When they wanted something they could speak perfect English but when you talk to them wanted something they all say, kiski say, don't understand. They didn't understand us in other words. So uh, we always had uh, little war, war skirmishes going on, the various religious sects in there, uh, the Binzwa, the Hao Bin, uh, there are various of them, and uh, they're all needles, uh, thorns in the sides of the Ngo Dinh Diem regime. Uh, they would do everything in their power, they were being supplied by the French and needled by the French because they didn't like his regime and they were losing their control uh, what they had left in South Vietnam and the Vietnamese forces uh, were taking over and the French were being a token force then. Uh, highlights there uh, were often uh, going out to the various sections of the country. We even went up north and we assisted in the, the refugee evacuation movement up there. Uh, surprisingly we brought I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of refugees from the north down to the south. And uh, we would go up to Hanoi and Haiphong to be able to process these people uh, to help them get there. And we'd often uh, do all the arrangements through the head person of the village. And the head person in those times, surprisingly, were Catholic priests. And the communist regime up there hated them so much. Uh, the atrocities that they uh, inflicted on these Catholic priests, you wouldn't believe. When I tell people about this, they said I was fabricating uh, the stories there. But they used to cut the, the tendons in their feet. I remember two occurrences there when they brought uh, Catholic priests in, they had stuck glass tubes in their penises and smashed the glass in there. And these poor men were in such agony, and they were a priority to get back for medical treatment down to the Saigon Cholon area. But we transported hundreds of thousands of people, and surprisingly, those we also transported people that wanted to go up north. So, it, it was uh, unusual if we had 50 people at any one given time that would go up north. And I was told that often these, uh, some of these people that went up north were intelligence gatherers for the South Vietnamese government and for the U.S. government. Uh, 
very often uh, when we're back in Saigon at our uh, quarters, uh, when we'd be driving back and forth to the military advisory compound, it was not unusual uh, when riding out in our buses or in our uh, jeeps or so forth, we would be fired upon, they would be always fired over our heads there, and they'd have us in such fear we never knew uh, if this was uh, it or not. Stop it there. Now that I've sort of recomposed myself, I was talking about uh, our trips going back and forth to our compound and the embassy. Uh, many times uh, we were fired upon uh, by unfriendly forces. We assumed they were either the Viet Minh or the Viet Cong at that time. And they would often fire at us and uh, there was really no place for us to go. We were forbidden to carry any weapons and the only weapons that we had were at the military compound and at the embassy and our primary mission was if attacked we were to use those weapons to hold the building for 15 minutes so that they could destroy the codes that was our sole purpose and that was uh, quite a revelation to a lot of the people serving with me other things that happened in there uh, at night time on many occasions, uh, we would be receiving warnings uh, through the intelligence network about uh, stay out of this area, but out of that area, because there would be communist demonstrations in downtown Saigon or in uh, Cholon or in the outskirts or of the places there, so we stayed out of that. And it was almost uh, without certainty on the nights that we received these warnings there would be concussion grenades being set off in the courtyard where we lived and that scared an awful lot of uh, our personnel there, including myself. On top of that, uh, we, there was one occasion there when our Vietnamese guard at the compound the, from the South Vietnamese Army was making his rounds and he came upon our so-called ally, the French, over leaned over one of the vehicles there, they caught him in the act of putting explosives in it. And they were going to take him down to the headquarters to be interrogated, and that's when he spilled the beans that he, along with several Vietnamese sympathizers, had wired our vehicles, and if it wasn't for the alertness of this guard, we wouldn't be here today. Needless to say, when he spilled the beans, uh, uh, he called out, uh, meaning he, the our, uh, South Vietnamese guard, called up and received and they took the Frenchman away and they rounded up several other uh, Asians uh, in the compound who couldn't be identified and took them off down to the, Vietnam, to the South Vietnamese Army headquarters there and I'm sure that they got uh, their just rewards. On another occasion, we think of the French as being our allies, well, while, excur while these uh, incursions were going on between uh, the various religious sects and the South Vietnamese government. On two occasions, our personnel caught them transporting ammunition in ambulances, a direct violation of the Geneva Convention. We tried to get the word out on this, but it was squashed. To this day, I have a dislike for the French and anything French. They can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. After that, uh, we were able to finish our tour. Several of us uh, went back, a lot of them uh, very nervous. Every time they heard uh, a truck backfire, including myself, I often cringed and uh, brought back memories of uh, those experiences we had. I was glad to be back on U.S. soil. And while there, I fulfilled the promise that I had made to a Navy Lieutenant, Howard Stewart, who urged me to take advantage of the GI Bill, which I did. I got out of the service after ten and a half years, leaving the Navy at the rate of uh, aviation storekeeper first class, which is the equivalent of grade E6. I went to Syracuse University, majored in radio and television, got my Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in those fields, worked in radio and television stations from then uh, at that point for a while, 
went into public relations work uh, and uh, used the skills I obtained while being a student at Syracuse University. Uh, it was quite uh, an undertaking uh, and something new for me uh, after having been regimented in that and uh, just about every move made for you. It was different going to college when you, you did things for yourself, learned how to cope with things, how to uh, meet every, any and all challenge and go ahead and do what was expected of you. Well, after that I uh, worked uh, in public relations fields. I worked for the American Red Cross. I then worked uh, for the New York State Department of Commerce in their Tourism Bureau, where I did ski reports, wrote a lot of their books, was involved in the famous I Love New York campaign from its start, uh, which grew to be a great success for the state of New York. From there, I took uh, an examination uh, for a health education media specialist with the New York State Health Department. I passed that being number one on the list of having additional credits from uh, my being a veteran. Even though as number one on the list, it took me six years to get the position because of the affirmative action things that went on. You can say uh, that males also experience discrimination. It wasn't solely a female thing. My work in the health department uh, was uh, very uh, informative and I liked what I was doing. During that time I worked uh, with the New York State Command Sergeant Major for the New York Army National Guard. And he knew of my background because we had talked a lot about our experiences in the service and he kept after me to uh, come on, join the uh, Army National Guard. Uh, well, finally he told me, yes, there, uh, he had uh, set up an interview for me. I went, uh, got into the public relations unit uh, and uh, stayed in there and added to my uh, service, uh, which totaled over 28 years, uh, almost 29 years. I was like uh, uh, maybe 30 days shy of a 30 years service. In the National Guard there, uh, the fellow I worked with, uh, well, he worked uh, when uh, working for the state government, I was his supervisor, but when in the Guard, I, he was my supervisor. That didn't make any difference. Uh, we all got along fine. Uh, the, the officers in the Guard uh, and the enlisted personnel were first rate. Uh, I enjoyed working with them. Uh, you could talk talk with either one of them on a first name basis, uh, but when you got out in the field, when there was work to be done, everybody reverted to what was expected of them, a strict military bearing. Uh, had some very good experiences in the uh, New York Army National Guard. One of them that stands out is when the New York State uh, Department of Corrections prison guards went on strike. And I think that lasted about 40-something days on there, and we were called to duty. Those of us, uh, we mean, being, being uh, those in the New York Army National Guard. It was our responsibility to man all of the prisons in New York State. And uh, we did that. Uh, when we first went in, the prisoners thought it was going to be more of the same from what they had experience from the prison guards. And uh, on many an occasion, they threw uh, urine, uh, bodily uh, um, stuff on the guards in there. And uh, it was uh, maybe a couple days later that their attitude changed because they saw that uh, we weren't treating them like uh, they were being treated uh, in there. Uh, one of the things uh, that struck me, I was talking with um, uh, a young prisoner who was down in the Cooksackie Correctional Institute and uh, asking him uh, about his skills. Uh, he was working in uh, the woodworking shop there and asked him uh, about being able to use these when he was released from this uh, situation. He said, uh, I hate to inform you, but a lot of us uh, will not be doing the, what we uh, received here in training. He says, uh, our uh, buddies, our cellmates, and what have you here, uh, gave us uh, information, the latest information on criminal things, brought us up to date on what was going, uh, 
what was the thing? What was the, the thing of the uh, current mode there uh, on uh, 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 stealing things from people? A uh, computer which was starting, uh, uh, credit card stuff, um, stealing mail, and uh, they learned quite an education in there, but in the wrong areas. And he said a lot of that would be lost, uh, but he would do everything he could to stay on the sta straight and narrow. But he didn't think that uh, because of his time in the state prison that he'd be able to get a good a civilian job there out in the civilian market competing with the others. Uh, one of the things at the prison strike that uh, we had, I was on the public relations team and uh, we went around with the lieutenant general who came from Washington, D.C., from the Pentagon, to assess how we were handling the situation, if there were things we need and so forth. And one thing that struck me was uh, he specifically asked to be taken to the state's maximum security prison in upstate New York. And he uh, wouldn't exactly say why, uh, but when we opened the gates there, he, told, he asked us to stay out and behind the locked doors. Uh, he wanted to know who, the, which cell so-and-so was in, and we went up there. And the surprising thing was we found out later that here was a man who was a Medal of Honor winner who was a prisoner for murder in the state's toughest security section. And the general went up to pay his respects uh, to him, not because of uh, what he did now, but because of what he did while he was in the service. It was a, a shock to see a man with such a uh, a high recognition in that situation. Well, the prison strike uh, lasted, uh, and then another highlight that we had was when New York State was awarded the 1980 Winter Olympics up at Lake Placid. Well, we were there was a big team of uh, National Guardsmen selected uh, from all across the state. Uh, I had the honor of serving 40, some, I think it was 42 days. Uh, the maximum people were up there were 50 days. Uh, that was from when people started arriving. Our major job was, we had uh, equipment hitting around here and there, was because of what happened at the Olympics over in Europe earlier, we were to provide protection in case there was an attack made on the athletes. In between uh, that, uh, we carried out public, uh, I carried out public relations duties, put out a daily newspaper there, went around and uh, handled uh, the, the credentialing of people who could uh, uh, get, gain access to the Olympic sites, to the various games, the venues there. Uh, our first uh, place that we were in was um, a newly built facility, which uh, was then turned over as the athletes started arriving turned over to the athletes and we were moved from that to the high school in Saranac Lake which was our headquarters for uh, the balance of the Olympics. That new facility that we started out in became a prison facility for those that were not uh, of the non, were non-violent types and that is still in use to this day. Uh, that, that Olympics was uh, highlighted by the U.S hockey team's victory over the Soviets, and all of the uh, Lake Placid was wild that night. Uh, you couldn't believe uh, the scene there. What you saw on TV, if you were able to see it, were old uh, TV clips and so forth, magnify it by a hundred times. People were all over, the Americans, as well as many European nations, uh, and the ath athletes from other nations were uh, Oh, they were ecstatic over this. Uh, they couldn't believe what was going to happen. Uh, also, we had Eric Hyden, the speed skater there. Uh, he did a fabulous job there in the medals that he won. Uh, it was an experience that, uh, I would say, for me, once in a lifetime. Uh, there, oh, it was uh, outstanding. Uh, it was so bad up there. The weather was cold, but the snow was lacking. And the way they got the snow uh, to be and uh, use it at all the venues that they had, especially the downhill skiing, the biathlon and all, is 
They got in touch with the Slutskys who operate Hunter Mountain in Hunter, New York. And at that time, they were the premier snowmakers in the United States. And they brought up their equipment and they made the snow. They ran 24 hours a day making snow and it was carted away to the various areas and uh, transported up the slopes uh, and spread all over and groomed so that they could use it for the events. Um, one thing that was uh, sad was the amount of frostbite that uh, happened in there. Unfortunately, uh, because of the smallness of Lake Placid, the transportation had to be controlled and there were several centers in there. But the people, and especially those that came from downstate, uh, and particularly New York City, I couldn't believe it to see them arriving with hardly any warm clothing on. And it was a, a shocking sight to see women climbing up on to go to see the downhill skiing wearing high heel shoes and very little warm clothing. And uh, we didn't have, uh, uh, from what I remember, a one uh, fatality there in skiing, an Italian gentleman, I can't remember his name. Uh, we were treated to the opening day ceremonies there with the arrival of the vice president uh, who came in and he, they had about 10 helicopters came in and you, no one knew which one he was getting off on. Uh, and uh, then uh, the ceremonies began, they lit the, the lamp there and uh, the highlight of that event was uh, the hot air balloons from the nations of the world drifting over the area and across uh, the area where all of us were seated. Uh, needless to say, everything was outstanding and uh, I never regretted uh, having the opportunity to serve in that even though it was cold and conditions for living were not uh, uh, on a par with what we normally would have at a military installation. But nevertheless, it was outstanding. Other things that we did uh, while serving in the National Guard, I had uh, tours of duty uh, over in Germany. I was assigned as the sole public relations person to a military police company from Utica, New York. Uh, they were split uh, up into four locations over in Germany. And uh, we were at Grafenweir, not too far from the Czech border. The troops uh, that were stationed over there, the regular army troops, were always uh, training. You could hear the tanks off in the distance because we were not too far from the Czech border. I took some pictures of the thing. I'm glad I have them as souvenirs because uh, all that stuff has disappeared now. But uh, when you could look out, uh, I could see through my camera. When I put on a telescopic lens, I could see the uh, uh, forces on the other side looking at us and being ever on the ready with their weapons in case something was happening. In between was a great big uh, field in there, barbed wire on both sides, and in, in between that barbed wire were minefields. And that was to catch any people who wanted to escape or any who were foolish enough to try to want to get into their territory. They always patrolled with uh, vicious looking dogs and they always went in threes and fours uh, on their patrols. Uh, that was a very uh, enjoyable tour. We got to see some of the sights in Germany and of course uh, uh, it was quite an awakening to take a tour of a former German prison camp and to see uh, what took place over there to those who were uh, put in captivity by them. Uh, the Germans were very methodical in their recordings. We had films over there that we could see. Uh, they had still pictures. Uh, and surprisingly, the one thing that uh, uh, shocked us was to find out uh, how they went out of their way to handle their own people, guards included, who showed any signs of sympathy towards the prisoners. Uh, they had pictures of them being hung, hanging with barbed wire around their necks. Um, and people that tried to escape uh, were left in the ditches uh, uh, where the explosives were. They left them there to rot. 
um, uh, the ovens there that they had uh, were ready to and were operational, but fortunately that was one place that they did not use the ovens to uh, uh, cremate uh, the Jewish uh, and other prisoners that they had there. Uh, the prison rolls had uh, Italians in there. They had uh, some of their own people in there. They had Catholics in there. Uh, they had Polish. Uh, they had just about every nationality from Europe in there that was active on the Allied side at that time, as well as those that they occupied. Um, and uh, it was very saddening and shocking to see the pictures. And I can imagine what our troops uh, went through when they came upon these sites and liberated them. Uh, the pictures and the films and clips that we saw uh, were very startling and revealing. And uh, I don't know why uh, people today don't react to these kinds of things that are happening in other parts of the world. Uh, they just don't want to get involved and believe that something like this is happening. I also did tour, a tour of duty down in Panama, and uh, we were there just uh, on an assignment uh, when we were supposed to go to Honduras, but at that time, many of the governors throughout uh, the United States were opposed to having any of their guard units stationed in Central American areas because of uh, uh, the hostilities that were going down there, and they did not want to have a bad name put on their state forces. And the state governors did have a say in how their troops would uh, could be used. And uh, we were there, uh, did uh, humanitarian work out in the jungle. Uh, we had uh, people uh, we assigned to uh, the engineering companies. They built bridges, roads, uh, what have you. Uh, helped people uh, fix their home, provided medical assistance and so forth. And when a lot of the people here think that uh, we went down to those places there, that we were going down to be as conquerors, that's a lot of baloney. These troops went down there and they did what was required of them. They were very humanitarian and the peacenik uh, groups there did a lot to demoralize people. Not all our troops, not only there in other Central American locations, but also it started back in the Vietnam era. It's too bad that we didn't have the support of the people, but if we people listen to stories like this, I'm sure that they'll see the other side of the story. And as Paul Harvey would say, now you know the rest of the story. Well, everything in the military is not uh, bullets and uh, bayonets. It's, uh, people think, but there's a lot of good that comes out of it, a lot of humanitarian work, and that still goes on today, whether it be active forces, reserve forces, National Guard forces, Air Guard forces. I'll have to say that the almost 30 years that I served in both the Navy, or 15, uh, rather for 10 and a half years, and the balance in the National Guard uh, were quite a valuable experience. I treasure every moment, and I enjoyed it. And thank you for this opportunity.